Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today, on this wonderful pancake world, we're going to serve up a little extra Canadian syrup for our beaver friend, and maybe even some whipped cream and sprinkles for dear Kristen. As we take a look at a little bit of history and astronomy. I've always been a lover of astronomy and loved the wonder of nature. Today we're going to look at a historical event that I feel confirms gravity as a force in the cosmos. For much of the past 2,000 years, astronomers have believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and that all other objects orbited around it. But in the early 1500s, Nicholas Copernicus developed his idea of heliocentrism, placing the sun at the center, not man. With this belief, Copernicus created his seven assumptions that heliocentrism is based. There is no center of all celestial spheres. The center of the Earth is not the center of the universe. All observable celestial spheres surround the Sun as if it were the middle of them all. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is greatly smaller than the distance from the Earth to the celestial sphere. Whatever motion appears in the celestial spheres is not from their motion, but rather from the Earth's motion while the heavens remain unchanged. The rise of the sun is not from its motion, but rather the Earth's revolution. Retrograde motion of the planets is not from their motion, but both bodies' orbit of the sun. These beliefs shook many astronomers to their core because it called into question the ancient supposition that the Earth and man were the center of everything. Following on Copernicus's work, Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe continued the work of conducting sky surveys. Brahe meticulously cataloged the movements of the planets, creating exact historical records of the precise location of Mars in the sky as it went back and forth season to season. He saw the benefits of Copernicus's use of geometry to predict the motions of the planet, but he still espoused mostly geocentrism ideas. In 1609, Building on the giants that came before him, Johannes Kepler published his first works on the laws of planetary motion. Kepler used the precise observations of Mars, provided by Brahe, to determine that planets didn't actually orbit in perfect spheres, but rather ellipses, and that based on their distance from the Sun during these elliptical orbits, their speed would vary. When closer to the Sun, the speed increased. When farther away, it slowed down. While Kepler didn't necessarily understand why the orbital mechanics worked this way, he was able to precisely predict their location in the sky year after year. The why of orbital dynamics wasn't answered until 1687 by Sir Isaac Newton and his laws of universal gravitation. Newton theorized that objects attracted each other based on their distance and mass. This series of advances and discoveries is the basis of much of today's physics and astronomy, and it brings us to the purpose of today's video, the odd orbit of the planet Uranus. In the late 1800s, William Herschel was conducting further detailed surveys of the sky, looking for comets. Most comets, similar to all planets, orbit the sun in a flat disk around the solar system, called the ecliptic. On the Earth, this is seen as a straight line across the sky where all wandering bodies can be found. Knowing this, Herschel focused his survey on this narrow swath of the sky. On the 13th of March, 1781, Herschel found what he believed to be a new comet, stating, I don't know what to call it. It is as likely to be a regular planet moving in an orbit nearly circular to the sun as a comet moving in a very eccentric ellipsis. I have not yet seen a coma or tail to it. Follow-on observations by other astronomers determined this was not a comet, but rather a newly discovered planet, Uranus. Over the following 40 years, astronomers across the world observed this new object again and again, and like all other planets before it, precisely plotted its orbit around the Sun. And using the laws established by Kepler, they were able to predict its future progress across the sky. Until the 1830s and 40s, 
when irregularities were found, not only in the ecliptic location above or below the line, but also in its distance from the sun. Some astronomers theorized that maybe Newton's laws of gravitation didn't remain the same at great distances, while others began to believe that maybe a massive object was located outside the orbit of Uranus. Unknown to each other, British astronomers John Adams and French native Urbain Le Verrier began to use Kepler's laws to see if there was in fact another body deep in the solar system. Le Verrier made multiple publications on his estimates of the planet's location, but not its orbit or its mass. He did this by placing a notional body at certain locations around the sun and extrapolating what that body's effects would be on Uranus. In theory, as Uranus swept past this object, its gravitational pull would cause a change in the natural orbit of Uranus. Finally, after proposing the position, orbit, and mass of this body, Le Verrier made a bold prediction of its exact location in the sky and sent it to his friend, Johann Gottfried Gale, at the Berlin Observatory. And on the evening of the 23rd of September, 1846, just after midnight, Gale turned the observatory's telescope to the precise location predicted by Le Verrier and found Neptune less than one degree from its predicted location. After two further nights of observations, it was confirmed this new body did move behind the background of stars. Gale anxiously replied to Le Verrier, The planet whose place you have computed really exists. Using nothing more than sheer mind power and math, from information gathered over the last 2,000 years, and the great minds of Copernicus, Brahe, Kepler, Newton, and Herschel, Le Verrier was able to predict the exact location of something that was unseen. It was unseen to the eye, but observable to the math. While modern globe-earth deniers will try to say that gravity is not real, and that buoyancy and density dictate the motion of the objects on the ground, they do not have an explanation for the motion of the planets, or the scientific advancements that began 2,000 years ago and continued from generation to generation of scientists, scientists that were able to use nothing but math to show that gravity does affect bodies in space, math that confirms the gravity we observe in the sky, math from the real observations of the real world, observations identified heliocentrism. Math described the motions. Gravity explained the fabric and science, not religion or ignorant denial, discovered the planet of Neptune. Gravity is real. We can observe it. We can measure it. It is not just a theory. It's the law. Thank you for joining me again this week, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this little trip down the history of astronomy and gravity and science. If you like my content, hit the little button down below and subscribe. Ring the bell if you want to get notifications. Hit the like button if you think I'm deserving of it. Comment if I got something wrong. And if you really like what I do, share it with a friend. I've had a great time over the last four months creating this channel. And the community that has graciously welcomed me in its arms is absolutely amazing. Thank you for your time. I know how valuable it is. And until next week, stay flat.